So obviously enough, I'm going to talk about thing called extended cognition. I mean, this it it can mean different things to different people. This is the way I've tended to understand it um, over the years. Uh, is the microphone working okay? You can uh, no. No. Uh, I think they lower it down. Okay. Uh, so this this is the way I've tended to uh, to understand it. Over is that any better? No. Yeah. Testing one two three four five. Any better? <laughs> you have to speak with your normal voice. That is my normal voice. You got a problem? <laughs> yeah, is that, that's better. Okay, I can hear that now. Right. Okay. Good. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, good, right. So, so the idea basically is that some, um, not all, okay, by, by any means, um, I don't think anyone wants to claim that all mental processes are extended or anything like that, but so, some are, um, e extending the organism's environment in the sense that they're composed um, partly, not completely, no one wants to claim that they're completely out there or anything like that, but composed partly uh, of actions um, broadly construed, performed by the organism on the world around it. Um, that's the way I, uh, the, that, that, that's the way I tend to think of uh, extending cognition anyway these days. So, Clark and Charles, uh, uh, an early statement of the view, let's call it. Um, I was, looking, I, was, I was looking through the web for pictures, actually, of, uh, you know, to, to make the talk slightly more interesting. And, uh, and then I, I found this. I thought, wait a minute. I think I took that. <laughs> or uh, <laughs> it's not a very good picture. You can tell my skills are strictly limited. Uh, I think Richard and John remember that, that, that night quite well in the, the harbor area of Sydney. Um, we were all a little, a little worse, worse for wear by then, as you can probably tell from the photo. Um, but, but anyway, uh, so. But they have a famous thought experiment, basically. Um, so, so centering on the case of Otto. Otto. Otto has Alzheimer's and writes various things down in a book, okay, information that he thinks will be uh, useful later on. Um, and um, at least on one interpretation, I'm not sure Andy and Dave really meant this, but on one interpretation, the, the sentences in Otto's notebook are a subset of his beliefs. Okay, so when Otto writes in his notebook, the Museum of Modern Arts on 53rd Street, this is one of his his beliefs. Uh, that's the way they've common be, commonly been understood. And so what we have here, it seems, right, is, is an imaginative thought experiment, um, which, is the, which is the sort of domain of traditional kind of philosophy, philosophical analysis. Um, and their conclusion that, 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 that the sentence is, is, is one of Otto's beliefs is based on what is ultimately a sort of philosophical view of the nature of mental states and processes, uh, functionalism. If something performs the right sort of function, if the sentence performs the right sort of function of a belief, then it is a belief. So we sit, here, here we seem to be in the sort of domain of traditional uh, philosophy. Um, in one of the early responses to the Clark and Chalmers uh, cognition, they, they, they leveled two objections to, to, uh, to the view. Uh, one was, was based on uh, what, uh, what they called intrinsic, but what's more commonly known as original intentionality. Um, the, Sado's, the, the sentences in Otto's notebook do not possess uh, original, in, uh, original intentionality. And, and, and this, again, seems to be a sort of traditional philosophical sort of objection based on a philosophical view about the nature of the mental. Intentionality is, is the hallmark of the, of the mental. Intentionality is what makes something mental. It's a sort of common view associated with the phenomenological tradition in, uh, in particular. <laughs> intentionality? Yeah, intentionality is, is the directedness of mental states. So, you know, you, you, think, you, you think that the cat is on the mat, then your thought is about the cat and its relation to, to the mat. So this directedness or aboutness of mental states, that is what, uh, that, that's what philosophers mean by intentionality. Um, so the idea then behind uh, the sort of Adams and Azar rejection is, is that the, 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 the intentionality of the sentences in Otto's notebook come from somewhere else, the mind of Otto. So they don't have original or intrinsic intentionality. Um, but if you're going to be a mental thing, then you, that's what you have to have. So the sentences can't count as beliefs. That was, that was the first objection. 
Um, they, they also have the uh, sort of very, very different objection. Um, Extended cognition would have, they, they argued, unfortunate consequences for the future development of cognitive science. Uh, psychological kinds will be messy, unruly ones, and no genuine science could be constructed on um, their, their basis. So this is a different kind of objection. It's not really a traditional philosophical objection based on analysis of the mental or anything like that. It's a point that uh, is rests in sort of philosophy of cognitive science. Um, and by the time they came to cognition, uh, this sort of general drift in the direction of the philosophy of cognitive science, I think, had gone a bit, a bit further. Um, the original intentionality argument, the sort of staunch traditional philosophical point that they made, um, had mutated into a sort of rules and representations argument. Um, the ba basically, the idea is that cognitive science is committed to, um, to postulating an apparatus of rules and representations, and uh, the original intentionality, this had now sort of migrated to the representations part. Okay, these representations that cognitive science is committed to postulating, they must have original intentionality, not derived. Um, so the idea that cognitive science is committed to postulating these sorts of representations with original intentionality. Um, so we have this sort of, I think, a shift from, from philosophy, philosophical objections, analyses, and so on, to a philosophy of cognitive science. Um, and Rob Rupert, my friend, uh, who, who uh, is sitting here today, is possible for anyone for, for shaping the sort of framework of discussion in, the, in, in, this, in, in this sort of way. Um, he sets out a stall in his 2004 paper, uh, challenges the hypothesis of extended cognition. Um, if heck, the hypothesis of extended cognition, Rob writes, does not provide a promising framework for the pursuit of cognitive science as it attempts to understand actual mental states, the radical theses of extended mind and extended self lose much of their current uh, appeal. Um, and in, 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 a, in a review of my book, a very kind review, actually, given that Rob probably thinks everything in it is wrong. Um, <laughs> So, so thanks, Rob. I appreciate that. Uh, Rob writes, um, what, uh, what, what scientific utility might there be to the inclusion of all of this as part of cognition? I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to imagine what all of this uh, is. But um, attempts to reinterpret cognitive science so as to draw the boundary somewhere else strike me as gratuitous. From the standpoint of philosophy of science, they would seem to amount to an unnecessary reinterpretation or remapping of current practices. Um, the book that Rob was doing um, was, was uh, The New Science of the Mind, where, where basically I think the, the, the project was to sort of argue that philosophy um, can play you know, a, a, a distinctive role, not merely that of a commentator on cognitive science. Uh, so an, an attempt to rehabilitate the role of philosophy, if you like. And it was based on two things. Uh, there was analysis of inten an intentionality. Um, actually, to call it an analysis is probably not quite right. It's more like a picture of intentionality, not an analysis. And uh, an analysis of cognition. Um, so the argument is revealing activity that conforms to the mark of the cognitive. Um, two parts to this. First, there's an analysis of intentionality as revealing activity. And secondly, there was an analysis of uh, cognition a so-called mark of the cognitive thing that various people have been arguing about. Uh, I, basically, uh, I can take it or leave. I don't really care that much about it. On, on, my, on my good days, um, I can convince myself that, in fact, my mark of the cognitive is a sufficient condition for cognition, but I don't really care that much because what, what the mark was was, was uh, something divine, de uh, devised with purely tactical rationale. Okay. Um, basically, it was it was a length of rope with which my opponents were supposed to conveniently uh, hang themselves, and um, as, so, so so the idea was to sort of develop a, a kind of a, an account, a sufficient condition for cognition that was so bland, so utterly anodyne that no one could possibly uh, object to it. Of course, it didn't work out that way, but they, there you go. Um, on the other hand, the analysis of intentionality. Well, you know, you have. Head fingers when I'm six feet under. Uh, that, that, that's something I, I sort of kind of like. So doesn't really matter for our purposes. I mean, the, 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 the basic idea was the core of intentionality is, is presentation, the appearing of something as something. If you want to get to the essence of intentionality, that's what, what it is. Um, 
And the directness of an intentional act uh, consists in its, its permitting objects to appear under aspects or empirical modes of presentation, as I call them. So intentionality turns out to be a form of revealing or disclosing activity, activity that reveals objects as falling under aspects or empirical modes of presentation. The cat is revealed to me as being on the mat. That is what the directedness of my thought about the cat is, uh, consists in, the revealing of the cat as being on the mat, for example. Um, then the argument was, well, revealing activity often, not always, not necessarily, but often, straddles things going on in the brain, the body, and uh, operations performed by the organism uh, on its environment. Um, so this is why intentional processes such as perceiving, thinking, remembering, and so on are often, not always, not necessarily, but often, uh, extended. Now, this probably doesn't mean much to you unless you've actually read the book, but uh, it doesn't really matter for our purposes. My point is today about two different ways of thinking about this issue of whether cognition extends. Um, there's a sort of philosophical approach. Um, based on questions like this, what sort of things are cognitive process, what's, what's the best picture for thinking about cognitive processes, what sort of conditions are necessary and sufficient, and so on, for, for a process to qualify as cognitive. Um, and then given this analysis, our processes the sort of things that might extend beyond the brain, and so on and so on. Um, so the natural object of inquiry of these sorts of questions from a philosophical perspective are sort of personal level psychological processes like thinking, perceiving, remembering, reasoning, the sort of things that we, intentional agents that we are, uh, do. Um, so this is part of the, the manifest image, if you like, of um, philosophy. Right. Um, if, if you were um, influenced by the sort of Rob Rupert kind of line, then, then you'll, you'll think of the question in a very different sort of way. Um, you'll, you'll think of the question in these sorts of terms. What sort of psychological kinds will a, will a, a, a cognitive science, mature cognitive science postulate? Uh, how will these kinds be individuated? Uh, what sorts of explanatory mechanisms will the science postulate? Uh, is it useful for these kinds of mechanisms to incorporate the extra neural and so on. And the natural object uh, of study, I think, of, of, of these sorts of questions is uh, subpersonal processes, the vehicles of cognition, as they're sometimes called. So th here we're dealing with the scientific image. So the first point is that to decide which way to approach these questions rests on trying to resolve issues about the relation between the manifest and the scientific image. And I, th I think prospects for um, quite uh, Grim. I mean, even deciding what questions to ask draws us into complex and uh, probably unresolved issues about the relation between the manifest and scientific image. So, if one thinks that the extended cognition stands or falls on its implications for cognitive science, that's probably because one thinks that the manifest image is in some way less than real, that it reduces to or be uh, eliminated by the, uh, the scientific image. Since we're not mm -hmm. the, 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 the manifest image is simply the way we think about ourselves in our ordinary everyday lives. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking now about how to respond to your question. That is a process. Um, uh, the manifest image is, is, is basically that. Okay? The scientific image is, well, the image of us that science reveals. So it's, think of it as the, the, the difference between the image of uh, sort of everyday, uh, ordinary everyday common sense view of ourselves and the scientific image. It's, it's, it's a distinction um, which was, was drawn by the philosopher Wilfred Sellers uh, back in the 50s, uh, 60s. Um, okay. So what we remember is that we can't, we can't avoid traditional philosophical, que philosophical analysis. Um, Traditional philosophical questions, you know, for example, concerning the mark of the mental, will, will inevitably resurface at some point. And these are not questions that can be answered simply by reflection on the practices of cognitive science. So the issue of extended cognition is, um, it's, it's basically whether, you know, the issue of whether cognition extends is, is basically, it's, it's, it's a philosophical question. So if I were a scientist who, for example, um, or an engineer try, trying to build systems which were capable of you know, perceiving the environment, retaining perceived information, reasoning perhaps on the basis of this information. Um, and let's suppose I, 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 in this project I discovered that by giving the systems I was designing an ability to manipulate things in its environment, um, this, this, this was helpful. It allowed me to reduce the complexity of the systems I were building and so on in various ways. Then, 
Would I care as a scientist whether, um, th whether these things manipulated were part of the cognitive apparatus or, were they, or whether they were simply an external form of scaffolding? I'm not sure I could. Or suppose I were a scientist discovering, uh, studying various um, abilities of animals, and I, I find that certain animals are able to um, manipulate their environment in various ways, which reduces the sort of cognitive burden on, um, on the brain. Um, would I care whether these manipulative, these manipulative strategies were part of cognition or an external scaffolding in which the real cognition took place? It's not clear to me that I would. And I think this is a sort of indication that the question is not really a scientific question at all. Uh, it's just a, it, it's, it's a philosophical question. And sometimes calling something philosophical is a way of denigrating it. I don't, I don't mean in that sense. I think it's, it's an interesting question, but it's not the question that some people have, uh, I think, have taken it to be. So. I'm going to skip the metaphilosophical of, um, I want to via a sort of um, a d debate that I've been having with people like Fred over, over the years. So th this is the mark of a cognitive, which, as I, I said earlier, I don't really care anyway. A process, P, is a cognitive process. This is what makes something. Th these four conditions are sufficient. That is enough for something to qualify as a cognitive process. Um, the first is that this, this process P involves information processing, uh, the manipulation and transformation of information bearing structures. Secondly, this information has the, uh, this information processing has the proper function of making available either to the subject or to subsequent processing operations information that was uh, prior to this processing unavailable. Third, this, this information is made available by way of the production in the subject of, uh, of the process of a representational state. And four, um, this process belongs to the subject of a representational state. Um, a, a, a relatively straightforward, you just look at cognitive, the, the, the sort of models cognitive scientists develop, and I think these sort of conditions emerge fairly quickly and easily from those. Um, Condition four was the hard one. That's where the, the sort of uh, the, that's where the analysis or picture of intentionality came in. But um, as I said, when I when I developed this, uh, I thought this 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 account of cognition is so it's so bland and so inclusive that uh, I don't I didn't think anyone could really object to this. Um, but of course, that didn't stop my friend Fred Adams. Um, all various objections. The first was that. Is this well? Now, of course, all the action is in four. Fred writes, "If uh, belongs to the subject means cognitive subject, then the account is circular and helps not at all. Uh, if it does not mean cognitive subject, then my computer satisfies all four conditions, and my cu computer is not a cognitive agent. Believe me, it is not. So his conditions are hardly sufficient for cognition. Um, this seems to be a, uh, based on a failure to understand condition four and the analysis of intentionality." Um, the project isn't to explain cognition in terms of cognition, but to explain it in terms of intentionality. Uh, cognition is explained as a specific form of intentional activity. Intentional activity is explained in terms of the idea of transcendental mode of presentation. And the transcendental mode of presentation is explained in terms of the idea of revealing or disclosing activity. A disclosure is primitive, though I distinguish different forms, but none of this really matters. The point is, um, this is a very sort of this is a kind of philosophical point about intentionality that the whole thing is uh, based on. So one of the implications is that cognition can occur only in intentional subjects, uh, and so Fred's computer doesn't have to qualify as cognitive at all on uh, on this. Um, it's just an information processing condition. Everyone and her mother thinks that cognition involves information processing, so Rowlands puts that in. Uh, yes, that's why I put it in. But the, the important issue is the kind of information processing. It has to be processing of semantic content. Trees and plants process information in the mathematical or communication theoretic sense of information, but no one thinks they're cognitive. So one is surely not sufficient, and in my view, not specific, about whether it's mere information or semantic content that's being processed. Only the latter arises to the level of the cognitive. I think I'll, 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 I'll talk about the first point later. I think co content doesn't have to be semantic at all, actually, um, in the sense of truth or valuable, for various reasons we'll see. 
But um, Fred's objection here basically, I think, rests on a failure to understand one to three. Information processing, the manipulation and transformation of uh, information-bearing structures, counts as information processing only because it has the proper function of making available information that was previously unavailable. It achieves this function by way of the production in a subject or a representational state. So the sort of information process will be the sort of information contained in the representational state. And you can, you can have any sort, you, you, can, you can invoke any kind of representation you like. I don't, does, I don't really care. Um, Roland's second condition, Fred continues, brings up the matter of proper function. The problem here as well is there's not just any functions that make up a mind, but the cognitive teleological functions. So unless we know which functions are at issue, this won't help much as part of a set of sufficient conditions for, for cognition. Um, this seems to be a failure to understand condition two. A function of making available either to a subject or to subsequent processing operations information that was pre previously unavailable. That's what, that's what makes a function cognitive. It's the function of making information available to, a, to either a subject or subsequent processing operations. And so conditions one to three collectively specify what, what a cognitive function is. Um, the, how much time do I have left, Stefan? Uh, you're okay, so, uh, another 15 minutes. Another 15 minutes, okay. I, instead, of, um, instead of boring you with the details of Um, let's uh, let me just get to the sort of point. The point is um, the mark of the cognitive I favor is based on a, uh, what seems to be a, a fairly kind of intentionality to evaluate it without doing philosophy, understanding what intentionality is. Now, maybe this is a problem with my accounts, but um, I don't think it is. Does it alternative um, characterization, his alt alternative mark of the cognitive. Um, cognitive processes involve states that are uh, semantically valuable. That's, that's his first condition. Um, I think that's actually clearly false if we understand semantic evaluability in the, in the usual way, because um, se semantic evaluation is a matter of being true or false. And this would rule out a staple of cognitive scientific practice, the postulation of mental maps, mental models, and so on. Uh, maps and models can't be true. For, uh, or false for, for familiar Davidsonian reasons. The notion of truth is connected with the logical connectives. So, for example, sentences are true, but the negation of a sentence is not a, uh, the, negation, the, the, the negation of a sentence is another sentence. The negation of a map is not another map. The disjunction of um, two sentences is another sentence. The disjunction of two maps is not a map. Um, but that's okay. We'll just understand this, this, his point in terms of accuracy conditions rather than truth conditions. We'll understand what he means by semantic in, in those terms. Um, for the record, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with one as long as we understand semantic evaluability in, this, in these sort of broader, broader terms. Um, Condition two, the, the, the contents carried by cognitive systems do not depend for their content on other minds. This is the original intentionality condition again. Um, I agree, but this is again a philosophical view of the mental associated with, with Brentano and the phenomenological tradition. Um, third, Fred says, cognitive contents can be false or even empty and hence are detached from the actual environmental causes. Um, I'm quite happy to agree with that. I think it's, it's you know, you don't get misrepresentation. Um, well, actually, I think Fred is actually running together two points, but, but it doesn't really matter. For our purposes, let's just accept that. Um, and fourth, representations must call representational content. Okay, which again seems a perfectly reasonable way of thinking about representations if you believe in that sort of thing. Okay, so. Why does Adams think his mark of the cognitive is incompatible with extended cognition? Um, condition number five that, that Fred smuggles in, which looks like this. Yes, he says, there, there are states that satisfy these conditions within the body and brain of a coupled agent. But no, there are no good reasons yet to think there's cognition going on everywhere along the causal chain. There are as yet no good reasons to think that cognitive processing is occurring anywhere outside the head. 
uh, outside of the head of the agent coupled to the environment. Wonderful, must apply everywhere along the causal chain, right? However, condition two, the original intentionality condition, seems to be what's crucial, okay? Because think of, think of the, 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 the Clark and Chalmers case of Otto. Otto writes things down in his notebook, right? Um, and these, let us suppose, are his beliefs. Um, but th these entries, these sentences in Otto's notebook are semantically valuable. They're either true or false, right? Um, they can be false or empty or detached, right? You write down the Mu Museum of Modern Art is on 54th Street, that's false. Um, you write down the Museum of Modern Art is on 54th Street in a world where there is no uh, Museum of Modern Art, then that's arguably empty and so on. So they, they, they can be false, empty, and detached. And they certainly explain, uh, play a role in explaining Otto's behavior. So what's driving the Adams case against extended cognition is basically the original intentionality condition. It's two. The, the, the claim that uh, the, the, the original intentionality condition, and only this, that precludes the sentence from counting as cognitive according to uh, Adam's criterion. So it all comes down basically to original intentionality or non-derived content. Um, so the, the case basically, in the end, comes down to this. The sentences in Otto's notebook do not possess original intentionality. Therefore, they're not mental, they're not cognitive. Okay? Uh, when you strip everything away, that's the core of the case against extended cognition. So you imagine Adam's point like this. You only find original intentionality in the head. You never find it out there in these, in these causal chains in which we're uh, sort of caught up. Okay? It's always, original intentionality is always only in the head. Um, Photo level this objection as well against uh, Clark's book, Supersizing um, the Mind. Um, this, however, this point, I mean, only rules out one form of extended cognition. Um, actually, we'll skip this. Uh, we'll also skip. To get to the crux, what's the justification for this idea that in a cognitive process must with original intentionality or non-derived content. What's the justification for this? Um, well, Adams says it, it's, it's this, you know, it's that cognition is the manipulation of representations according to rules. Okay, the rules and representations again, which, you know, is, is, is not anywhere near as widely accepted today as it once was, for example. But let's, let's, let's just not worry about that for now. Let's assume that the rules and representations approach is um, correct. So, put in those terms, Adam's point is that these representations um, must have non-derived content. Okay. Um, so, ever along, so non-derived content must extend all the way along the causal chain. Here's Otto manipulating his book, flipping through it, reading the sentence: "The Museum of Modern Art is on 53rd Street." Cognition is not out there because the thing out there, the sentence, does not have original or non-derived intentionality. That's, that's, that, that's the case, basically. Um, then the question is, well, how do we assess this claim? Even if we assume the rules and representations frame, the rules and representations framework is correct, how do we assess this, this claim? Are we going to get it from an examination of cognitive scientific practice? Um, Fred thinks we will, but I, I think examination or reflection on cognitive scientific practice yields the opposite conclusion. It's not true that any cognitive process must be an operation performed on a representation at all. And that is true even if we assume that the rules and representational framework is correct. So, um, and it, so the issue, the reason, the reason is this. I mean, consider an example of, of um, take, take the retinal The retinal image is not, in fact, a representation. Okay, it's commonly thought of as such, uh, but it's not a representation. And the reason is that there's no difference. Um, the representation has no normative grip on the world. I'll explain what that means in a minute. There's, there's no difference between what actually causes a pattern of light intensity values distributed over the retina and what should cause it. So the image is simply caused by whatever causes it. Um, so because of this, um, the, the retinal image makes no normative claim on the world. Um, 
Therefore, there's no possibility of misrepresenting. You can put it in that way. It's not possible for the, the, the retinal image to misrepresent the world. Um, nevertheless, in the traditional rules and representational framework, um, processes operating on the image are, you know, regarded as cognitive. That's, you know, take Mars account, that's where cognition starts with processes ap applied to operating on the retinal image, creating the raw primal sketch and so on. So, um, the reason the reason that a retinal image is not a representation is, is you, you, you can sort of get this reason basically from thinking about something Fodor said a long time ago. Um, the same retinal image could, could, for example, be caused by a horse or a donkey in the distance. Okay? Um, no sense can be given to the claim that the retinal image should have been a horse. We can't say, for example, the retinal image should have been caused by a horse because the horse is, in fact, there. If so, I mean, what, what retinal image should the donkey have, uh, have caused? So there's no normativity at this stage. Normativity only comes in downstream, if you like. Um, we'll forget on grounds of time. But it's a really, anyway. Um, this is how normativity the causal impingements responsible for the retinal image. The brain makes various guesses the image. And by guesses, I mean various assumptions, uh, various principles of assumptions uh, are applied, continuation, closure, common fate, and so on. This is in, this is in Mars' way of looking at things. Okay. Um, if the world turns out con contrary to, to these guesses, i.e. The, the, the applied principles, then the brain has guessed wrong. Uh, now, we have, now we have the possibility of mistakes, and now we have normativity and consequently the possibility of misrepresentation. So, the, re the retinal image is not a representation in itself. Uh, it, it makes no normative claim on the world. It, 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 it's, not possible, it's, it's not possible to talk about misrepresentation in connection, with the rep uh, in, in connection with the retinal image. There is no representation unless there's a possibility of misrepresentation. Therefore, the retinal image is not a representation. So normativity comes in. The possibility of mistake comes in only through subsequent processing operations. There's a more general point which emerges from this, which, you, which is quite independent of the sort of Marian example I gave. Given the rules and representational framework, which I don't, in fact, believe, but I'm assuming for the sake of argument, um, it's the application of transformational rules to a structure that transforms this structure from one that merely carries information to one that represents. Uh, the application of rules transforms the structure from one that does, uh, does not to one that does make a normative claim. Um, so, or to put the same point another way, you only get the possibility of misrepresentation after the rules have been applied. Therefore, the thing to which they apply is not a representation. So, what's crucial is the application of rules that creates representations. Therefore, these rules must initially operate on things that are not representations. So, even if you assume the rules and representational framework, which, which many people profess to hate today, um, it still doesn't follow that anything that, that's part of a cognitive process must be a representation. The claim that cognitive processes must operate only on non-derived representations cannot uh, be sustained. Uh, cognitive processes operate on representations, but they also operate on things that are not representations. Uh, or to put the same point another way, the, the architecture of cognition must consist in more than vehicles of content. Two themes right here. The, the, the first is that um, Adams is wrong in his contention that cognition must involve the application of rules to representations with non-derived content, because it does not even need to involve the application of rules to representations itself. And this is so even if we assume the rules and representations framework. So how can how can Adams uh, be so wrong about? the rules and representations approach, uh, framework and its implications. And I think the answer is, is, is pretty clearly that his position is not really motivated by reflection on cognitive scientific practice uh, at all. Um, what we have, basically, what's driving everything, what's driving this debate, is um, a philosophical theory of the mental combined with uh, a non sequitur. The theory is that you know, the non-derived content condition um, 
the non-derived content condition basically doesn't come from cognitive science or philosophers' attempts to reflect on cognitive science or anything like that. What it basically comes from is, 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 is an old theory of the mental, um, according to which intentionality, the aboutness of mental states, this, this is what the essence of the mental is. So this is a philosophical theory of, of the mental associated with, uh, with Brentano and um, the phenomenological tradition. So that's the philosophical theory. That's, that, that's part of what's driving, uh, I think, this, this sort of debate. But partly, I mean, we have the non sequitur. Unless you have non-derived intentionality, you, know, you, don't, you don't have anything mental. The, the non, this is the non sequitur. The first claim is fine. Unless you have non-derived intentionality, you don't have anything mental. Non-derived intentionality is the hallmark of the mental. I'm quite happy with that, you know, old, old Brentanian that I, that, that I am. But from this um, respectable claim, I think, Adams has inferred this. Every part of the mental cognitive process must consist in operations performed on structures that are non-derived representations. Um, but that, inf that inference, the inference from one to two, is the non sequitur. And it's, 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 it's not an inference that's ever been defended adequately, I think. And um, crucially, any attempt to defend is not going to be found in reflection on uh, cognitive scientific uh, practice. Unfortunately, we still have to do philosophy. Uh, we, can't, we can't even begin to assess these claims until we know things like what intentionality is and, and so on and so on. And we're not really going to get that from the philosophy of cognitive science. Um, on the account of intentionality I favor, uh, extended cogn cognition emerges as just a sort of mundane implication of the picture of intentionality as uh, disclosing activity. Um, extended consciousness emerges from this because all intentionality is, in its core, in its essence, is revealing activity. And this revealing activity often, not always, but often just straddles things going on in here, things going on in the body, and things we do in and to, uh, in and to the world. Now, you may, hate, you may hate that picture of intentionality, and it may well be wrong, but um, I think the message of this paper, basically, is that it's, it's a mistake to suppose we can avoid these sorts of questions. So the, the question of extended cognition does not simply it does not simply stand and fall on its implications for uh, for cognitive science, and that's all I got. Thank you.